Hey, welcome back to the podcast. I'm excited about today's episode. We are talking all about how to rebuild your life. And I am no stranger to the rebuild. And sometimes we rebuild because we have to, or we're at a time where it's like, yeah, it's go time. Something happened, something significant, and it's time to rebuild. And the rebuild can also be a choice, right? We don't always have to change or choose to rebuild in a time of, yeah, heartbreak or hurt or despair or necessity. We can also choose to rebuild and create the life that we want just because we choose to. So maybe you're listening to this and you're like in the middle of a rebuild and maybe it was a choice. Maybe it was something where you just really had to take action, but I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Um, Actually for full transparency, I've already recorded this episode and then I watched it And I went for a walk and I took some notes and there were just some things that I wanted to add and kind of change a little bit. So normally when I record podcasts, I have like a few notes written down. I'll press record, just go for it, right? But for this one, if you're watching the video, you can see I have a ton of notes. In fact, I'll probably end up taking a picture of this and sharing it with you guys because you could see some of these notes that I took. Um, And yeah, usually I just do it in one take and this time I just decided I want to redo it and I wanted to add a little bit more um, meat on the bones, if you will. So um, yeah, like I said, I am no stranger to the rebuild, uh, sometimes by choice and sometimes because I absolutely had to. I had no other choice but to rebuild and to regrow and to reroute down and all of the things. I can think of some stories that I have rebuilt from. I remember my boyfriend in college, he cheated on me and I was completely devastated. Uh, I remember when I um, moved to Austria. When I moved to Austria and didn't speak any of the language, a different country, of course, that was a choice to move there. But the rebuild was definitely challenging. And then moving back to the USA, which was also a choice, but not as Yeah. I mean, now looking back, it was an amazing choice, but it was something that I did out of necessity because it was COVID and I was in my apartment, not able to go anywhere or do anything. And I just figured, hey, if I'm not going to go anywhere and I'm not going to do anything, I'd rather be with my family. And so that was a choice to rebuild. And that was very challenging. Um, Maybe you're losing a job or transitioning into a different job. That's important for a rebuild. Also, um, yeah, realizing most recently that in all of my previous relationships, I hadn't really been faithful. In fact, I hadn't been um, realizing that I was the cheater and choosing to rebuild this time with my partner now has been very powerful, very, very powerful and a very powerful choice. And when I was 23, I fell in a grocery store and I hurt my back and I couldn't really work out or walk or do very much for three months. And on top of that, my roommate at the time kicked me out because she said that um, I, I wasn't contributing to cleaning and my back was hurting. I couldn't even walk. And so that was a very interesting situation, unexpected, where I just was like, yeah, very injured. And then I get kicked out of my apartment. It was very, very uh, intense. And so, yeah, maybe some of those stories resonate with you. Another one is family trauma and rebuilding after that. Um, Six or seven years ago, my grandpa like pretty much threatened to disown me because of my choice in boyfriend. My boyfriend had – at my boyfriend at the time – had tattoos and my grandpa threw a fit and threatened to disown me. I didn't get Christmas gifts for a few years. Just like really intense stuff to rebuild. And when I was thinking about all these stories of the rebuild in my life, I realized, okay, sometimes I rebuilt my foundation with freaking toothpicks. And now I'm learning how to rebuild my foundation regularly with strong, sturdy bricks, with strong, sturdy, deep roots. And yeah, there's been times, like especially when I think about being cheated on by my boyfriend in college and rebuilding, what I rebuilt was a wall that never really trusted people. And 
I know that's why I became the one that cheated moving forward was because, yeah, that happened to me. And even though it wasn't conscious, it was definitely subconscious in this learning and growth and excavation I'm doing, I realized, yeah, that was a very like painful experience. And oftentimes when we are in pain, we pay that pain forward in the same way. And that's not often um, what I believe we should be doing. We shouldn't be passing on our pain. We should be learning and growing from our pain and passing on our learnings. And so I can definitely think of times that I rebuilt, like I said, with toothpicks and then things would break down again. I have to rebuild again. And so what I want to share with you today is this acronym that I created out of the word rebuild. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven letters in rebuild. So it's essentially like seven powerful parts of the rebuild. It's not like a step-by-step process where first you do one, then you do two, whatever. It's really just using the word rebuild to identify what key points have really helped me throughout various rebuilds in my life. And now I see the rebuild as fun and an opportunity for growth. And I can remember times where the rebuild was really hard and really challenging. And the rebuild, um, you know, yeah, was was just challenging. And so wherever you are, I think that you'll get something from today's episode. So let's jump right in. Uh, rebuild R, the first letter R stands for recognize your role. Recognize your role in the demolition as well as the rebuild. I think that understanding that you made choices that contributed to this situation, and most importantly, you can continue to make choices that can help you rebuild that situation. Now, of course, if something tragic happened, uh, that's not absolutely not your fault, right? But it is your fault if you don't choose to rebuild. It is your fault if you stay in that victim mentality too long. I don't have a duration for you. I don't know what the duration for kind of marinating in some of that pain a little bit first is. But it's a choice. It's a choice when you choose to not be the victim anymore and choose to create more of a hero story out of it. And yeah, I... I'm a firm believer in ownership, right? So recognize your role is like a fancy way of saying that ownership. And even if, even if someone did something that was really painful to you, like maybe you were cheated on or you're, you lost your job or something, I still believe that the ult, in ultimate healing lies the ownership of the actions that led up to that particular situation. So yeah, it might not be, of course, your fault that something like that happened. But if you're really taking ownership, you can go back and be like, okay, I could see how like this decision, this decision, and this decision led to this. And I'm not really proud of, or I want to up level and elevate those particular decisions leading up to that. I find that that's very, very powerful too. When I think of the word ownership, I love words. I love words. I love communication. I think that words and the words that we use can completely transform and change our world. And so I love the word ownership because when I say it, I think of own your ship or own your shit, right? So it's just like the ownership of the entire vessel. And I remember when um, one time when I was living in Austria, one of my close friends, Rochelle, she I, I met her when I lived in California. I moved to Austria. She ended up moving to work on a ship and she was part of the crew on a ship and they would like a private yacht. They would go, you know, travel all over the world. And one time her ship landed and was getting some rep um, some repairs and things done in Mallorca, Spain. So I was living in Austria at the time and I went to go stay with her for a few days on the ship. The owners were off of the ship and um, yeah, she's like, yeah, you can come. I have like a week off, come hang out for a little while. So I came and hang out for a, a weekend and it's like in those ships, especially these big like master yachts that she was on, there's like all of these like hidden um, things you don't see. Right. So there's all these like hidden passageways for the crews to walk around. There's like all these different levels. I mean, I don't know if you ever guys have been on like a super yacht or something like that, but 
they're really freaking incredible. And there's a lot that you don't see. There's a lot of behind the scenes. And so when I think of own your ship, I think of that particular ship and I'm like, oh yeah, there's a lot more than what meets the eye. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that happens just like in ownership and recognizing your role. So that's the first one. And that can be very triggering. A lot of times people want to point at things outside of ourselves. Oh, you did that to me. They did that. They made me this way. Like I said, there might be situations you need to rebuild from that are not your fault. And whose fault is it if you don't choose to rebuild it yourself? Nobody else can do the rebuild for you, right? People can help you and be there to support you, which we'll talk about in the next one, but you have to do the work. You have to create the meaning moving forward. You have to create what's next, right? That's the R, recognize your role. The next letter, E. Engage with your friends and people close to you. Engage. Okay. This doesn't mean that you need to call your friends and give them an update and share everything all the time. Engage does not mean you need to be, like I said, engage doesn't mean you need to be sharing the whole enchilada, telling everything all the time. And I say that because for me, I'm an introvert. And I know there's a lot of introverts out there that when it comes time to do that work, I tend to recluse. I tend to work in a little bit. But what I found is what I found is that when I'm not engaging with my friends, when I'm not reaching out to those that are close to me, it's much more closed off. So it's great to have your peeps in your corner. And you have to go into the ring, right? Especially important for introverts. Like we have to go out into the arena and we have to be in the ring doing our thing. I think of like a boxer analogy, like life can be tough and it can throw blows. But then when we come back into the corner, when it's like ding, 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 the round's over. And there's that guy who's like putting the ice on the guy's face and putting the, the, that like coconut oily type of stuff so that when the guy punches, it slides right off. Some guys usually like whispering in the guy's ear, like, you got this, come on, go out. You got this. Don't give up. You can do it. You know? And I really think of that boxer's arena. So engaging, like I said, doesn't mean that you need to bring people along for every part of the journey. And if you're someone that's more extroverted and you love to give your friends updates and people close to you and that continuing process of conversation is helpful, then go for it. But um, if not, just make sure that you're engaging. Make sure that you're showing up and and giving them a little bit of progress. I know that, um, you know, also from the other end of the spectrum here, engaging. Okay. So as in, when you're in the rebuild, yes, reach out to your friends, engage, don't recluse, don't be too secluded. Make sure that you remember that there's there, that there's people there rooting for you. And then at the same time, on the other end of the coin, like if you notice that your friend is in the middle of a rebuild or someone that you love, you're like, yeah, they're really, you know, engage with them too and engage with them in a way that is, not accepting reciprocation, if that makes sense. So for example, I had a friend of mine who I could tell she was like in the rebuild. She was doing the work ins. And from personal experience, I know that oftentimes we change, we become very different. Um, we choose to be different and that change is different, right? So I remember engaging with her and reaching out and being like, hey, babe, I know that you are in the midst of a rebuild. I know that you are doing some internal work And I just want to let you know that I want to get to know the new version of you. I want to, I want to, you know, be friends with that version, whoever you're becoming. I don't want to hold you in the same space where you were. I want to meet you where you're at now, where you want to be. So I think that's important to mention as well. And then, you know, when you're engaging with your friends and things like that, when you're in the middle of the rebuild, it's just nice to, to, to not seclude enough. So that way, as you decide like, Hey, I no longer want to engage in this behavior, or I realized, Oh my gosh, I'd been holding on to so much anger because of this particular situation. And now I want to be this way. I think it's important to share that with our friends and people that are close to us so that we can, um, yeah, let them know how we're choosing to be, right? Let them know what we will no longer tolerate or what we're realizing about ourselves. So I feel like that engaging process um, with our friends and really people that are close to us that we trust and we're close to can be really, really helpful. 
I recently got the chance to hang out with my aunt, my uncle, and my cousin, and her husband and their kids. They came out to Huntington Beach, California, which is about an hour from where I live. And so I got to meet up with them and hang out. And we, it was a rainy day. So we went out to this Mexican restaurant in Huntington Beach called Fred's. And it's like, if you've been to Huntington Beach before, it's just like a uh, a Mexican restaurant that's, um, yeah, it's kind of high on this building. It overlooks the ocean and it's really open. There's like pool, it's fun stuff to do. So like the kids didn't have to stay seated in their chairs or whatever. So we were just like hanging out. It wasn't really that great weather. We just, I met up with them for lunch. We talked for like a couple hours and it was so awesome because me and my aunt and my uncle, we got into some deeper conversation that we don't normally get to do because the last time I saw them was at Christmas. At Christmas Eve this year in 2022, we were 70 people, 70, seven, zero, okay? My big Italian family, everyone gets together on Christmas Eve. It's absolutely insane. So of course, I don't get a chance to like really have deep conversations with everyone in my family when I see them on Christmas Eve because there's so many people. And so we had some really great conversation. And at the end, we were all like, yes, like this is so awesome. Like we, um, we don't feel alone, you know, and I was sharing some things with my aunt about anxiety and stress. And she's like, man, I wouldn't have, you know, thought you would be that type of person. And I'm like, well, yeah, cause you know, I try to see the bright side and I, I really work on my mental health and I really work on, um, taking that next step forward instead of dwelling on the past or whatever. And, um, yeah, it was just a really good conversation. It was very much engaged so that we could understand like, okay, here's where we are and here's how we can continue to support one another. Now that doesn't mean I need to call my aunt or my family every single day and give them an update, but it's just nice to engage. It's nice to allow people to be like in your corner. That's the E. B. So we have R, recognize your role. E, engage with your friends and close and close uh, people that are close to you. And then B is boundaries. What did you learn in this particular situation as you are rebuilding that you need to set boundaries up with? What will you tolerate in future relationships? What won't you? You know, I remember after the whole situation with my grandpa, it was really challenging. And I was like, okay, I don't want to completely, you know, not be, there was a time where I just didn't go around my family at all. There was a time where I just, yeah, didn't go to any holidays. I just did my own thing. I was just like, no, I'm not going to um, be around that. My boundary at that time was like complete disconnection and not seeing them because it was really hard. Very, very, very traumatic. But now my boundaries, um, or as I gotten older, or the time has gone by, let's say, and I've also gotten older. I realized, yeah, I can kind of shift my boundaries and I can be around him, but just in small doses when there's a lot of people. Sometimes I'll go to lunch with my grandma and my grandpa and I just have to really um, practice how I want to show up and just be kind and remember that, you know, I get a chance to do better for future generations based on what I've learned through the way he treated me. And yeah, every now and then I'll do that, meet up with him and my grandma for lunch. But I don't do the things like I used to with them. I don't spend a lot of time with them like I used to before. And yeah, I think it's important. You know, even after going through my most recent breakup and even previous breakups, we get to choose our boundaries and what we will and will not accept, even in friendships and things like that. Um, and then also, I think people get excited. Okay, let's say you've you know, you've done the rebuild or maybe even not done the rebuild. That's not the right way I want to say it. How do I want to say it? Like we get excited about our goals and about our next steps. And we're like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to show up as this or whatever that we forget to put our values and put that on a leash a little bit, right? Give some boundaries to that because just as important your goals are just as important as your boundaries. What you're going after is just as important as what you're like, no, that's not okay. So setting solid boundaries is really important. And, you know, I coach a lot on core values. I love coaching on core values. I love doing sessions where people really get to define their core values and who they want to be. And 
we have to set boundaries with those as well. In fact, I was reminded of this by my boyfriend. I was working on my core values, um, re, yeah, just kind of re-rooting down in them, changing them a little bit, adjusting some because I had created my core values a couple years ago. So I was just making some adjustments and I shared it with him and he was like, yeah, okay, now you know, make sure that you have your boundaries. Make sure that you have opportunities to defend your core values, right? It's like we have to have boundaries that are set in place so that we know when we're ready to take action and we're ready to be kind of involved and when it's just like, nope, that's not what we do. That's not what we tolerate. That's not who we are anymore. So in that rebuild, building solid boundaries and getting very clear on what your boundaries are and also getting very clear on communicating your boundaries. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but that's what I work with a lot of my one-on-one -on -one clients with is like, as I'm growing and up-leveling, how do I communicate with these people around me, my family members, my coworkers, all the people that may not be doing the work that I'm doing, how can I communicate clearly with them who I am, what I will no longer stand for, and um, that's really, really helpful. So when you have your core values and having those boundaries, it's just, yeah, really amazing. I don't know if I got sidetracked there, but I just get, yeah, just really stoked on, on boundaries and on helping people communicate about their boundaries and be able to say, hey, you know, this, this type of communication I like to use. And it can be very funky for most people, especially in the beginning. And it was a, um, it was funky for me too at the beginning, but I mean, we have to communicate better. We just have to communicate better. And so I love communicating about my boundaries and being like, hey, you know, yeah, or not even yeah, like, no, I don't want to come to that. And that's because, you know, one of my core values is this. And I just, yeah, I don't really feel like that's, you know, something that I want to do. I, one of my core values is I'm a magnet for miracles. And what I do know is what turns down my magnet alcohol, staying up late, being around people who like to gossip. So those are things that I just really try to not engage with and set boundaries around. And I understand that when I'm around situations like that, it's I can feel my magnet get weaker. If I've been drinking a lot and not getting good sleep and I'm around people who are not, I don't need to, my friends to be, I don't need the people around me to be positive all the time. But I want my friends to take ownership. I don't want them to be talking about all the things outside of them that are bothering them and this and that and this person. Like, I'm here for it in certain situations, but I definitely have boundaries with how long I can be around it and also boundaries with how I communicate with it. So it's like if someone's around me and they're maybe talking crap or whatever, I just usually become silent. That's like my boundary. And if someone asks, I'm like, mm, I don't really want to talk about that. Like, that's not who I am you know, and be able to set those boundaries there. I feel like being able to set your core values and your boundaries is great, but it's even better when we can communicate them. And so I like using words like, no, thank you, because my core value is, and that's not in alignment with it, right? And so when we don't have the clarity on our core value, we might just be like, no, I don't want to, and I don't know how to tell them. I don't got to make up an excuse as to why I can't or what. It's like, no, be real. Who are you? And what do you stand for? And what do you not stand for? And get really good at communicating that. Get really good at communicating that. So that's the B, boundaries. You. This one's awesome. I love this. My mentor says this, so I actually totally stole this from you, from her. But uh, the you is, you got an issue, issue. <laughs> I think that this is a great reminder to lean into uh, because the rebuild isn't in a vacuum, right? So as you're rebuilding, other stuff will come up. Other people will do their thing. Life will do its thing. And in this rebuild, we can't expect that we're in a vacuum and like, okay, no, I was in pain and now I'm rebuilding. So everything has to just be perfect so I can rebuild. It's like, no, you're going to, as you rebuild, you're going to continue to find opportunities to recognize your role. You're going to continue to find opportunities to look in the mirror and be like, oh, that was me, you know? And then as you start to re-engage as this rebuilt version of yourself or however you want to call it. There'll be triggers. There'll be things that test you. The universe is not going to be like, oh, you want to be this way? Okay, great. The universe is going to be like, you want to be this way? Here are opportunities again and again and again and again to be this way so that we can give you the reps, right? It's just like doing workouts, right? You got to put in the repetitions. You got to put in the reps to prove 
that you are being who you say you want to be. And in that process, ownership is important. So I put that in there. You got an issue, it's you, because I think it's just important to remember that. Like just, I think after hearing me say this, you'll probably remember and hear this, you know, hear my voice in the back of your head saying that. I think that's really important to continue in this rebuilding process. It's like, okay, you know, it might be time that you need to like Look at the look at the plans, right? The, your rebuilding plans. Maybe you have like a construction plan or whatever, and it's up to you to like tweak it as you go along. If you realize that there's something that's an issue, and you have to take care of it, so that's the you. And I just feel like that's a great reminder throughout the rebuild, throughout your life, no matter where you are. The more ownership we can take, the more that we can recognize our role, the better. Okay, so you got an issue, it's you. Okay, the I. Identify your core values. I kind of mentioned that in the boundaries there. Um, if this was like in a listicle order, I would have put core values above boundaries. But because I was creatively working with the letters that I have, that's why I stands for identify your core values. Core values are a set of rules to your game so that you can win. Core values include what you what you already are, that you love, that you want to continue to be, and a little bit of what you want to become. Right. So sometimes, uh, like, hella honest is one of my core values being hella honest. Um, hella, because I'm from NorCal. So we often say, we'll say hella. That's a very common phrase. Like, it's hella hot or I'm hella tired. It's just like a word we use. But when I say hella honest, it reminds me of like a, uh, the, the hometown I come from. It reminds me of like that 209 level of honesty. And 209 is the area code of the area I grew up in. And so we always say, oh, I'm from the 209. I'm from the 209. In fact, when I lived in Austria, there was a girl from the 209 that worked with me in Austria too. And when we saw each other, we were like, oh my God, you're from the 209. So anyways, my one of my core values is hella honest and it says i'm a i have a 209 level of realness and honesty and that just reminds me of yeah being the realest of the real because i have even though the town that i grew up in i don't know it's not fantastic by any means in terms of like there's not a beach close by there's really nothing to do it's kind of a pretty boring chill farm town but um we have a lot of really good people like I've met a lot of really good, solid humans from my hometown. And I know they're solid because I've been all around the world and talked to a lot of people. And not a lot of people have solid hometown friends that they've been friends with for a really long time, like a lot of us in the 209 have. And so when I think about that honesty, um, it reminds me of that hometown core group level of honesty. And I know that I yeah, have a lot of honest qualities. But when I talked about it before, like, yeah, I've been dishonest a lot. I've cheated in a lot of my relationships, you know? And so that's a reminder for me too, to be like more honest, right? To see more opportunities to be honest, more opportunities to tell the truth. I also grew up seeing a lot of people with like little white lies, like you know, oh no, sorry, I can't because like, you know, the dog tipped over the water bottle and it hit the rug and then there was water and we had to dry it. Like little white lies that weren't true, like anything. That wasn't an example of one I've heard before. But so as I got older, I was just like, I don't like that. Like, I don't like that feeling of just little white lies. I'd rather just be like, no, because according to my core values, this is not an alignment rather than, you know, lie about it or just try to figure out a way out. Um, I used to, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't remember it very recently, but maybe like five years ago or so, I remember a period of time where I would say like, yes to something or I would put something on my calendar, but the whole time trying to think of an excuse as to why I wasn't going to go, you know? And that's not honest. I would rather just say no at the time. No, I don't really feel like it now, but if I change my mind, I'll let you know, right? So when I think of core values that include what I know I am, an honest person, but also there's certain areas where I have to be real. Like I've been dishonest, right? Whether it's a little white lie or you know, dishonest in a relationship because I was cheating on the person, you know? So I think that choosing core values like that, that give you a little bit of what you already have, but also a lot of bit of what you want to become. So then you're really held accountable to that. And 
what did I write here? I put, they include my current superpowers and ones I'm currently working on. So I feel like that completes that really well. I wrote that in my notes there. It's like, yeah, what are your current superpowers and the stuff you want to continue working on? And they really, your core values go into all areas of your life. So how do your core values show up in your relationships with others, romantic or friendships, or your relationship with yourself, or your relationship with your coworkers, or how do they show up? How do your core values show up when you're waiting in line for your coffee and the lady messes it up and you have to wait 20 extra minutes? How do your core values show up when you're super tired and you show up at a hotel and the check-in line is a mile long or the guy is taking forever? Like, how do you, how do your core values show up when you're driving in a parking lot and someone takes your spot? Okay, like your core values get to really show up in many areas of your life, especially when we normally might not show up in a super way that we're proud of. Everybody's different. But I think that's like the real the realness of the realist. You can say you want to be, you know, kind and all these things. But when you go out into the real world, are you actually being those things? Are you actually being those things regularly? And of course, you're going to mess up and there's going to be opportunities for learnings. There's going to be opportunities through living through your core values to set new boundaries. You might be like, oh yeah, I thought that you know, being honest meant this, but now I realize, okay, no, I need to set some boundaries around honesty because you know X, Y, or Z happened as I was experimenting, embodying my core values, right? When we first you know, get our core value list, it might not feel like, All of that is us yet, but we get a chance to embody that. And when we're embodying that, we get opportunities to see how that happens when we engage in the world like that. And then we get a chance to set those boundaries. And we also get a chance to go deeper in some of those relationships because of um, better, stronger, more rooted core values we set. So if you already have core values, then lean into them. Make this I another L in rebuild and um, lean into your core values. Look at them again. Revisit them. I read mine every single day. I have a set of eight core values that I have coordinated with the energy centers or chakras in the body. Um, I guess there are seven chakras, but with the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza that I'm very involved in deeply, there are eight energy centers. So I have identified eight core values that coordinate with those energy centers that when I do my meditations and I visit all of the energy centers, um, just a quick side note, if you are familiar with the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza or not, one of his very powerful meditations that I love is called the blessing of the energy centers. And so you do a little bit of breath work in the beginning, and then you go through each energy center and you bless that area and you bring positive, uplifting, vibrant, healing energy to that space. So when I go through the different energy centers, I connect with a particular core value that I have set. And I just decided to do it that way. Um, You don't have to do it that way. I don't have any clients that I work with that have set up their core values like mine because I don't think that's important. Um, You can have a list of five or of 10, no more than 10. But for me, that's really helpful because then I can bring my core values into my meditation. That's the I. The L stands for learn. This one is just always be learning. Always look for opportunities to learn, whether as a student So maybe you just decide like, oh, I want to join this course, or I have this new interest that sparked after this rebuild and I want to learn more, or just proactively learning from a situation, like learning patience from when you're waiting forever in the coffee shop for your, you know, mocha latte with three pumps and this twist. I always get so tripped out on people's Starbucks orders because they're so like specific and precise, but how can you learn from a particular situation like that? Can you learn how to be kind despite someone maybe not serving you with the best customer service ever? I think that's really powerful. So my word my word for 2023 is grateful growth. But my word for, and I did a whole podcast episode on that before. I'll link it in the show notes. You can check it out. I think it's episode number 107, if I'm not mistaken. But my words for 2022, so my words last year, Uh, were relax and learn. And so learning, I just feel like on those days when I was feeling meh after moving back from the US to Austria, being in my parents' bedroom or my parents' house in my childhood bedroom for nine months with like all my niece's toys and everything everywhere, it was very helpful to be like, okay, what can I learn today? Not necessarily always like, okay, what can I learn from this experience? Yes. And like, 
what podcast can I listen to and learn? I watch a lot of the Huberman Lab podcast, which I love. And, you know, you learn a ton from that. I joined a, um, a breathwork certification course. So I became a certified breathwork facilitator and I've incorporated more breathwork with my one-on-one -on -one clients because I chose to proactively learn. And I think that as soon as we stop learning, as soon as we stop desiring to learn, I feel like that's death. Like, Really, I really feel like that's death. When we are not ready to keep learning, when we're not ready to keep excavating and peeling back those layers and discovering what's next and being curious and wanting to grow and wanting to learn, and instead you just decide to become stagnant and not learn and just like think you can't do everything and all this stuff, it's like, no, that is death. I think that learning is life and continuing to learn from others, from circumstances, and also proactively as a student, taking courses, learning things on, you know, I think YouTube is so amazing. I take, I watch so many um, podcasts on YouTube and so many courses and stuff that are available for free or just very minimal amounts of money that I just feel like always be learning, always be putting yourself like in the classroom. Okay. Like in the earth school, like make sure that you have that learning, that receptive, like that you are receptive to learning. Let's say it like that, because then you'll always be learning something, always be learning. D last one in our rebuild. D is decide daily. Decide daily that you're going to keep rebuilding. Decide daily that this is who you want to be. I was listening recently to um, my boyfriend's podcast, him, and he interviewed my mentor, the girl, um, Aubrey, who certified me as a life coach and NLP practitioner because she's just so phenomenal. And they did a podcast together, which was so good. I'll also link it in the show notes. And about NLP, which is one of the techniques I use with my one-on-one -on -one clients as well. And he's done NLP sessions with her and I've done some NLP work with him as well. And so he was asking her like, you know, I noticed some profound changes immediately, but like how fast does this generally work? And what Aubrey said was, well, how fast can you decide? It's like, as soon as you decide that you're going to rebuild, as soon as you decide this is who you no longer want to be, as soon as you decide who you do want to be, it's a game changer. And you have to decide, right? If you decide, no, I want to stay in the past or I want to stay in that same loop and I want to tell myself that same story, I want to tell myself that person's always like all the things. It's like as soon as you decide in that split instant, your life can be changed. And we might have to remind ourselves, right? We might have to decide daily, decide daily that this is who we want to be and who we want to become and remind ourselves, right? It's like, nope, come on, give ourselves a little nudge. Sometimes we go to that autopilot. We go back to our old ways. We go back to our old ways of doing things, our old ways of communicating, all of that. And we have to redirect and decide, decide daily. I know that I'm different and that difference comes with a decision right? We have to remember that. That difference comes with a decision. And I may need to redeclare and redecide daily. I think I can just, you know, speak for myself as a woman and our hormone fluctuations and, you know, different times for me surrounding ovulation or surrounding my menstrual cycle. I can have feelings of just like, yeah, not feeling good. Like those PMS feelings are just kind of not feeling, and it can be very easy to kind of go back into those ways, but I have to remember and decide daily. And that's why having your core values, and I've talked about before, starting with the why, um, you know, being able to read and go back and look at those core values to remind you why you started, to remind you what you declared and what you decided to do. And in this rebuild, it's not going to be easy. There's no timeline. I don't know if you've ever built a house before, but I remember when my parents built the house that they're in now, and even more recently, my boyfriend who just moved into his new house. It's like, yeah, you might think there's a timeline for the rebuild, but then things happen as you start to build and whatever, and it can take a little bit longer and it could be a different route than maybe you anticipated. But as long as you decide daily that you're committed to that rebuild, nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop you. I had to decide daily when I was at my parents' house in my niece, in my former childhood bedroom, which became my niece's room. There's like all the toys and the princess bedspread and all the things. Like that environment for me, I'm so grateful for it. 
am so grateful for my family and for my parents that they allowed me to come back to their space, no questions asked, whatever. But it also was my childhood bedroom. And I was 33 at the time. And I was just feeling like, or I was 32 at the time. And I was just feeling so, yeah, just down and sad and in despair and heartbroken you know? So during that time, during the rebuild, which I still feel like I'm in that rebuild now from moving back from Austria, it took me a couple of years, but in that rebuild, that time during the rebuild, I had to decide moment by moment. There were some times where I had to like, or have my friends engage with friends who I was close to, to really help me remind me that I made that decision and help re-remind me to re-decide in that moment. And so yeah, some circumstances in that rebuild, we have to just keep redeciding, redeciding, redeciding. And that's totally okay. There's no problem with that at all. So, yeah, that's the rebuild acronym R, recognize your role. E, engage with your friends and people close to you. B, boundaries. U, you got an issue. It's you. I, identify your core values. L, learn. And D, decide daily. I'm so grateful that you joined today's podcast. If anything spoke to you or you had an aha moment, or if you want to jump on a one-on-one session to get some more clarity on your core values, I love to do two-hour sessions with people to just really get their core values out on the table. So if that's something you're interested in, you can shoot me a DM on uh, Instagram at Life Like London. I'm pretty much Life Like London everywhere on social media, but on Instagram. I'm like kind of always in the DMs there. So you can send me a DM and be like, Hey, London, that rebuild episode really spoke to me. Here's my aha moment. And then also if you decide you want to do a core value clarity session with me for two hours, just me and you one-on-one, we can totally do that. I have some openings still. So you can contact me there too. Or if you want to, you can just hit reply to any of the emails that I send to you. So if you're on my email list and you get my newsletters and updates, you can just hit reply. The replies go directly to me. I reply to them directly. So you can do that. And if you're not already on my email list, then make sure you grab your free mindset calendar. Your monthly mindset calendar. You can get that at lifelikelondon.com forward slash calendar, and you can pick that up and then you'll be right on my email list. And then you can always hit reply and contact me there just to let me know how this episode spoke to you. And um, if you're in for some core value clarity, I would love to connect with you one-on-one and help you create the magic that is core values. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a beautiful day. Remember, it's never too late to read rebuild. Rebuilding can be a choice. And if you find yourself knocked over and down, remember that you can choose to rebuild and get back up at any time. doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but the rebuild is always possible. Have a beautiful day and we'll see you at the next episode.